Good morning. My name is Ian Glass, and I would like to welcome you to today's Prairie Habitat Joint Venture Policy Committee webinar, Hydrology Research Within Prairie Water, a Global Water Futures Program. In today's webinar, Environment and Climate Change Canada research scientist, Dr. Chris Spence, will briefly introduce the Prairie Water Program and the hydrological research being conducted within it. If you could, everyone could please save their questions till the end of the webinar. Uh, and type them into the uh, chat box. Uh, we can address them then. Uh, Chris, whenever you're ready, please uh, take over. All right. Thanks, Ian. Um, I hope everybody can uh, can hear me okay. If, if not, just uh, maybe type in. Uh, Hugh Hunt uh, asked me to. Uh, uh, provide this, this webinar is kind of a follow-up to a, uh, a presentation that was given during a workshop down in Regina back in 2016 uh, and sort of the, to provide a bit of an update on on some of the hydrological research going on on the, on the prairies that's relevant to, uh, to, to wetland management. Uh, at, at first I was a little concerned because uh, I'm, I'm not sure we've made enough progress to really present something, but after some some thought, um, what had been done is really taking some uh, some of the feedback and input uh, uh, that was provided at that that 2016 workshop, uh, and um, among a, um, several other initiatives, uh, to to really maybe coalesce into a bit of a plan, and that that plan has come together in. In, uh, in the hydrology theme of uh, prairie water. So that's where I kind of decide to focus on is not so much what we've done, but um, what we what we plan to do over the next three years. Uh, and uh, before I proceed any further, I, I'm really just a front man um, for much of what I'm going to talk about, it, uh, which I'm doing in uh, collaboration with a number of people at the University of Saskatchewan. Uh, Jared Wolf is the, the program manager of Prairie Water. Uh, Kevin Shook uh, is a research associate. Baloo McConan is a new postdoc uh, that will be doing a lot of the, uh, the hydrological modeling. I'm sure we're all familiar with John Pomeroy and, uh, and Hannah Belch as well. Um, this is just a slide that, that from that May 2016 workshop, uh, some of the uh, Just concluding remarks of the, uh, the presentation I gave, and, and I kind of highlight some of the uh, some of the points uh, that that are important uh, as as we move forward. And that is that uh, we have to better understand wetland and watershed uh, water budgets um, and how they interact. Uh, that means more field programs, uh, but those also have to be coupled with uh, uh, with model development. We have. Uh, much to do when it comes to uh, properly embedding wetland behavior and function in some of our uh, both hydrological and biogeochemical models. Uh, so, that, but the way that we're all, the only way we're going to do that is, uh, is frankly, is collaboratively uh, through uh, through knowledge exchange and some, some back and forth. Um, just to uh, um, perhaps some of you have uh, heard of the Global Water Futures. Program. It's a an immense uh, set of uh, set of projects uh, that that really have sort of brought the University of Saskatchewan and its partners to the forefront of uh, water security research, uh, not only in Canada but also uh, also globally. Um, the uh, sort of the yin yang diagram on on your right. Conceptualizing some of the, the pillars of, of global water futures, um, and where prairie water sits in is really in a pillar three, which is designing user solutions. So it's, it's not necessarily science for science's sake, but it's um, what can global water futures do to, to help address some of the most pressing needs in, uh, in water resources uh, across Canada, and, and in particular in, in this instance in the prairies. So Prairie Water is a, a Pillar 3 project, and at its heart, it, uh, it really is about building resilient communities uh, and pro 
providing them with uh, the information that they need to make uh, informed uh, short and long-term decisions about how uh, water is, uh, is managed. Uh, and it's not just how water is managed, but also uh, all the activities that can affect water. Uh, so I think specifically uh, when it comes to agriculture and land management choices, uh, but not exclusively. Uh, there are components of industry, uh, especially within the, with the groundwater component. Um, there are four themes within prairie water, uh, hydrology, groundwater, Wetlands is probably uh, uh, the most populated, and, and governance. Uh, and, and all four of these are uh, working together to, to address that that goal of uh, providing information uh, that, that should help people make wiser decisions so that uh, their communities can be more resilient. Uh, but bringing it back to perhaps what we're interested in today is uh, uh, the wetland complex, and I just want to sort of reiterate some points that people like Misaki and Garth Vanderkamp have made that um, we can't necessarily look at individual wetlands in isolation. Um, and uh, uh, meet some of the uh, societal uh, goals that I think we want to meet. We have to look at the wetland. We have to look at wetlands as a as a complex. That there's a, a distribution of these things across the landscape, and, and how they're distributed in terms of their size, their volume, and their, their functions and behaviors uh, is important for uh, or understanding not how that complex behaves is important for uh, making wise management choices. Uh, and this next slide kind of really reiterates that as well is that we have certain science and. Uh, certain activities that affect individual wetlands, but uh, we really have to understand how uh, these upscale to the watershed. Uh, and it's not just uh, sort of flows and loads, um, but it also how, uh, how function upscales. Uh, what's, uh, what are the, the important bits, the, the important individual wetlands uh, at, at the watershed scale? Uh, and what can we how can individual wetlands be, be managed to influence what goes on at the watershed scale? So in, in prairie water, and at least in the hydrology theme of prairie water, we have uh, three major questions. Uh, we really want to know how water cycles in terms of uh, precipitation, evapotranspiration, uh, runoff, infiltration, uh, will respond to future conditions of uh, climate and especially um, land use under different climate scenarios. Uh, you know, it's really difficult to separate those two. Um, do these responses change in different parts of the prairies? Um, I guess intuitively we would think that uh, applying the same land management practices, uh, selfish swift current, um, might result in a different hydrological response than uh, the same choices being made in, uh, in southern Manitoba. And uh, key to a lot of this research is uh, what are the roles of the wetlands in all in all this? Um, do they, uh, and how do they change with, uh, within these different uh, prairie landscapes? Um, this is a, a slide, I guess, stolen again from that main 2016 workshop. And it's basically showing some examples of uh, what's typically done to, to understand the role of wetlands on prairie stream flow regimes, and that's applying models. Um, so much of our, I'll call it understanding, but some of it is more of uh, much of our uh, uh, hypothesis proposing uh, has come from, uh, from model simulations. And uh, I... It, 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 at least it's my opinion that the wider applicability of some of these model predictions to uh, changes in uh, uh, land management, wetland distribution, etc., is sometimes a point of debate. And, and some of this goes back to uh, the fact that we do have different landscapes on the prairies. Uh, so to, to address this, um, the hydrology theme has uh, come up with this idea that 
perhaps we need to classify catchments uh, across the prairies. And so uh, what you see in this slide is a, uh, uh, it's actually a global product of, uh, uh, derived from uh, the shadow, uh, the, uh, the sh uh, sorry, the space shuttle radar uh, product. Uh, somebody's managed to uh, create a, a network of catchments uh, across the better part of the globe, uh, all of about 100 square kilometers in size. Uh, and this is a, a clip of, uh, of just the sort of prairie ecozone. And so what we'd like to do is classify each one of these catchments based on its attributes uh, and, and proceed from there and, and see what, uh, what kind of distribution uh, that has. Uh, and so uh, Jared is, is actually leading this effort right now, and he's doing the not ins un unsubstantial task of pulling together uh, a lot of uh, data sets from across the prairies. Uh, we're looking at catchment area, uh, precipitation, uh, an estimate of runoff. Uh, I don't have evapotranspiration in there, there, but it is sort of a function of temperature, which is going to work. Uh, we've got soil layers. Talk about wetland fraction and distribution in a moment. Uh, stream order, uh, topography, that uh, the reddish tone image there is actually the standard deviation of the slope, uh, which kind of we're hoping represents the, uh, uh, I'm not sure if this is a word, but the hummockiness uh, of the landscape. Uh, and then the one below is the uh, superficial geology, I believe. And then we've also managed to. Uh, get our hands on some predominant crop and land use uh, layers. So we'd like to put all these in, um, probably do a, uh, uh, try a few things with pr principal components analysis or canonical correlation to see if we can come up with a classification scheme. And I think we're aiming for six to 10 uh, catchment types. That's what we're hoping to identify across the, across the curve. Um, wetland, Representation in particular is a bit of a head scratcher. Um, so one of the things we might try to do, this is an image of uh, uh, wetlands uh, identified at the, some of you may rep, uh, uh, recognize this, uh, at the St. Denis National Wildlife Area. Uh, and that's the cumulative frequency of wetland area uh, for that uh, area using that particular data set. And perhaps we can uh, use the shape of that curve to, uh, within each of those catchments to, to represent uh, how wetland area is uh, distributed within each of those catchments. Um, uh, it's relatively easy to get wetland fraction uh, from such an image, but that distribution is a bit, uh, bit of a hard enough to crack. And, uh, exactly how do we represent distribution? Because it's not just that cumulative frequency, but it's also uh, things like uh, proximity to the outlet that, uh, that is also that are important that uh, people like Kevin Schiff have identified uh, as perhaps things that we should try to include in our uh, capital classification system. Um, and all this is leading to uh, what we'd like to do with the, the modeling is that uh, we're going to do some virtual basin modeling. So. This is an example. We're going to start with the Vermilion uh, because that's where we have some very good uh, data. But, uh, and Blue Maconin is, is the one leading uh, this particular effort. And I want to be clear here, I and mean, we're not actually going to model the Vermilion. We're going to model something that looks like the Vermilion. So it will have, um, we will, from that catchment classification exercise, we'll will discern the, say, the, uh, the soil type, the topography, uh, the uh, predominant cropping practices, uh, the, uh, the wetland distribution. So we won't be modeling every wetland in there, but we'll be modeling a network that looks like the network uh, in the pavilion. And, and we're hoping that from, from this exercise, that um, rather than modeling a specific basin, since we'll be modeling something that looks like the vermilion, which is representative of, say, um, a, uh, 
class, what will end up being a class five watershed, uh, then we can take the results of, of that modeling effort and extrapolate it across the rest of the catchment class. Uh, and that's how we're extrapolating across, uh, across space. Uh, and so the next couple of slides are some examples of some of the outputs that, that we expect to have. Uh, so uh, some, some hydrographs in, in, in this instance. Um, and the, I'm sure none of you can really read much of this, but the, uh, what I want you to take away from that is sort of, for example, this, the red line there is the, uh, uh, the storage, the wet, wetland storage uh, for one particular run uh, of the vermilion. And it's more or less to, to illustrate that we're making some progress on this. And what we'd also like to do is run scenarios. So uh, what we could do is say, well, let's put a bunch of wetlands back into the system uh, and see what that red line does uh, in terms of wetland storage. Or can we do it? What happens again um, if we try a, a different sort of, uh, land management or wetland restoration or, uh, or wetland drainage? Scenario, and then run that some run those scenarios again under a changing climate, uh, sort of informed by uh, some of the uh, scenarios that are up there. So whether things become wetter or drier, I think we all agree that they probably all become warmer. Um, so it is uh, wet and dry, and and then also over, um, and this is important to, to going back to sort of the resilience question: is uh, uh, what happens over a uh, uh, long term. Uh, over the long term versus perhaps the short term. You know, what might be a wise choice uh, during a very dry condition um, could end up being a very poor choice uh, when things get wet again. Because, uh, uh, climate change being what climate change is, um, we will still have cycles of precipitation on the prairies. And, uh, and it would be important to understand uh, what happens in the long term. Uh, and, and we could look at things as well like infiltration, uh, which the groundwater theme folks are interested in in terms of uh, aquifer recharge. So um, it's, uh, there's more and more evidence that uh, depression focused recharge is important for, uh, for uh, adding to the, uh, the aquifers below. And, and so uh, it would be interesting, I think, to see uh, how perhaps that flux changes uh, in, in some of these scenarios as well. Uh, and I'm sort of touching on this a little bit, but this uh, this slide is kind of showing how the uh, the different themes are interrelated within prairie water. And uh, we all in in the group we all see hydrology as the, uh, as the foundation. So much of what I was describing is is going to support some of the other investigations that the other things are going to have uh, in terms of the, the groundwater theme. I touched on that with the infiltration side, but also in terms of uh, some of the questions that the wetland theme has in terms of biodiversity or pesticides or, or nutrients. And I'll, I'll touch on the nutrient uh, in, a, in a few minutes. And, and the governance theme is, is sort of pulling on all of, all of this information in terms of uh, trying to learn how uh, people end up making decisions, as it, it, given different types of information. Uh, so I want to uh, touch on, on wetlands and or, or what some of the things the wetland theme is doing, uh, especially with uh, some of the uh, information that we hope to produce from the, from the hydrology theme. Uh, some of the questions that the wetlands group is trying to, to uh, answer are, Similar in some sense to the, the hydrology theme, uh, you know, how do climate, land use, biodiversity, and socioeconomics interact uh, to, in, to inform wetland function and, and decisions people make about uh, wetland management? And this is always a, a neat question: uh, uh, what wetlands must we keep? Uh, and that's kind of a loaded question. Uh, but it's must we keep for what? Uh, and, and that kind of goes back to some of the socioeconomic questions and the biodiversity questions. Uh, I'm curious to, to see what we find out about 
um, what's most important, say, for biodiversity, and, and that may not be the most important stuff for, uh, for nutrients. Uh, but I guess, you know, let's see. Um, I just wanted to bring up the idea of function. Um, hydrological function has been classified by, by other people in the past as uh, storing, contributing, or transmitting. Uh, the hydrograph there is a, an example uh, uh, from work I've done in the Northwest Territories trying to split apart these, uh, these different functions. So that sort of helps you visualize things. Uh, but biogeochemical function is somewhat different but related and that it's classified as Things are either being stored in a certain location, or they're being provided or sourced, um, or they're being transformed uh, through some sort of chemical uh, or physical process. And what I think is a group is that we'd like to be able to demonstrate how wetland distribution affects this biogeochemical functionality at the wetland scale. Oh, sorry, at the watershed scale. And this goes back to some of those slides I had earlier about, uh, about the wetland complex. Uh, there's a few ways we'd like to pursue this. Uh, there is always talk of some sort of a land management experiment. Uh, in the sense, if you look at those two slides, which which I might, I have to say, these are not the same place. These aren't the before or after, but they do kind of substitute space for time in terms of a, uh, a poorly drained landscape and a well-drained landscape. Uh, so we are kind of conducting experiments all across this landscape as, a, as we try to manage uh, water on the landscape. So there are opportunities if the right partnerships present themselves uh, to maybe uh, observe these uh, uh, and document some, some of these changes that are uh, predicted to have happen um, during some of these modeling exercises. Uh, I think it would be a, uh, a fantastic opportunity if we can find the right partners. Which is sort of a, a physical experiment. The uh, the other side, of, and we'll certainly do this, is uh, link the hydrological model with uh, with some biogeochemical models. And, and Helen Balch has some ideas about how we can do this, and they sort of increase there in terms of order of complexity. Uh, and in terms of uh, we can assume chemostasis, which is just assume constant concentrations, nothing really happens. But we know that's not necessarily the case, so we do understand that there are some rates of change in those concentrations, so we can uh, slap those onto the model flows and see what happens. Or we can actually couple the two, uh, couple the two models, the, the hydrology and the hydrology. And what we'd really like to do is map this back into the class classification framework. So uh, don't please don't think that those colors on that map mean anything right now. Uh, they don't, but, uh, but they do kind of help as a visualization of uh, this extrapolation exercise that we, we hope to be going through. So what we can, what we hope to do is um, find out which classes are most prone to change, whether it be from climate or from uh, different land management decisions, uh, and map that back into the, into the, into the catchment framework uh, in the GIS and then and then color that up um, in a similar manner to that ducks um, slide uh, ducks image in the, in the top right hand corner uh, where you know sort of uh, red is uh, uh, where an area that might be most prone to this particular type of management uh, choice or, or climate stressor uh, and blue would be perhaps uh, one that's uh, less vulnerable. Uh, and then we're hoping that that kind of informs at, at a landscape scale uh, where we should consider certain choices and where we perhaps should not be doing things. Uh, so just to sort of wrap things up a little bit, maybe I went through this a little faster than that, but, um, So I hope we've, uh, I hope I've demonstrated that we are kind of implementing a plan uh, to help evaluate how uh, different land management choices uh, will influence hydrological function uh, across the wetland complex uh, and at, at sort of the catchment scale, uh, but also across the diversity of different climate scenarios and across the diversity of the uh, prairie landscapes. Uh, and what we're hoping to do is uh, take those uh, sort of hydrological outputs uh, and 
form different parts of uh, different, the different themes of prairie water, but as well, I think our uh, different stakeholders uh, in, the, in the program uh, of what the impact might be on uh, the biogeochemical and, and other functions of the wetland complex. And then map those back into the catchment classification framework so that we have a nice uh, sort of uh, visual uh, or a nice image of where in the where we, where we sh shouldn't uh, perhaps implement certain, uh, certain practices uh, moving into the future. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Uh, thanks. Does anybody have any questions for Chris? Um, Chris, do you have any plans on how to share interim results so that as to inform policy deliver deliberations? Um, well, I, there's going to be a, a number of different ways. Uh, we, uh, we hope to have uh, uh, ongoing workshops. Um, where you know, we might meet as a sort of the entire prairie water program uh, or individual themes. Uh, I, I think these webinars are a, are a good idea. Uh, the, the prairie water is going to have an advisory committee uh, that uh, is still being shaped right now, but one of their tasks is certainly going to help inform, is to inform uh, the investigators within prairie water about the best way to, uh, to distribute results. Uh, not just you know, at, at the very end, but, but uh, as the uh, program moves, moves forward. Uh, we, we hope that this will be quite an, quite an iterative discussion um, over time. So I, I think as long as we keep the lines of communication open, we might succeed there. Great. Right. Uh, what would uh, be an ideal policy outcome of this work? Well, um, I have to admit that's not not necessarily my department. My department is more on providing information that, that, would, in, that would inform policy. I, I would hope that um, I guess there's I get there's two ways we can I can answer that question is. Uh, um, one, what information do people who make policy need and in what form uh, in order to make the decisions that, that they see are relevant? Um, uh, and the other side is uh, I would hope that we're on the right track with, uh, with the mapping exercise uh, in, in that it, it will help inform uh, all of you, pol uh, uh, decisions on policy of where something like a best management practice um, would be useful or would not be useful in, in meeting some uh, certain, whether they be nutrient reduction goals or biodiversity goals or, or even uh, sort of socioeconomic things to sort of maximize uh, farming. Great. But we would be looking for feedback on that in particular, but as you may it is a bit of a core exercise. So if we're, uh, if we're going on the wrong path, I think now's the time to let us know. All right. Well, there don't appear to be uh, any more questions. If you do have additional questions, uh, you can feel free to email uh, myself, uh, and I can forward them to uh, Chris if you have any more at a later time. Uh, Chris? Uh, thank you today for your informative presentation today, and thank you everyone for joining us. And uh, please join us on January 17th for our, our next uh, webinar.
And I would like to take this time to wish everybody a happy holiday season and a safe and healthy 2018. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.